I'm going to begin this morning by extending a special invitation to you. Because of all the construction that's going on at the church this year, because of how flexible we're having to be with gathering to worship and all the different aspects of the life of this congregation, we are unable to be able to celebrate Christmas Eve on our campus. And in one of the worst kept secrets at Peachtree, sandwiched in between the musicals Annie and Aladdin, sandwiched in between the Steve Miller Band and another band called Widespread Panic, <laughs> sandwiched in between John Chris, Tina Fey, and Amy Poehler, Peachtree Presbyterian Church is descending upon the historic Fox Theater of Atlanta to celebrate our Christmas Eve services. <laughs> So we, uh, we're expecting a big response to this among the congregation as well in the broader community. We want to put it on your radar first that come November the 15th, uh, free general admission tickets are going to be available through the Fox Theater website. And so we'll give you more information about that. And there's going to be a 1 o'clock service. There's going to be a 5 o'clock service that day. And we're going to turn that theater into a cathedral. Uh, for the gift of Christmas. The live animals will be there. I'm coming in on a zip line. It's going to be great. <laughs> and uh, so just looking forward and just want to make sure that I know you already marked your calendar for Christmas Eve, but this is a special year in the life of our church. And I also, before I begin, just want to acknowledge, admit, offer my concerns and prayers for the situation that's happening in the Middle East. We had a, a prayer service earlier this week where we gathered specifically to, to pray for our brothers and sisters in Israel and to, um, to be a part of the presence. It's amazing to me, everybody I know in Israel that I have texted and said, what can we do? They immediately say, please pray. That's not a last resort for them. That is a first action and consistent presence of what they are looking for from the church in a moment like this. One of the things that absolutely broke my heart this week amongst all of the difficult and terrible stories was the story of a couple of people who were refugees from Ukraine who had sought sanctuary in Israel to be able to flee the warfare that is ravaging their own country, and yet they are finding themselves that they are two of the victims of people who were killed in Israel from the atrocities of Hamas. This is a messy situation. This has been going on for a long time in terms of conflict, but it has reached a new and fever pitch. And we pray for justice, not for revenge, but for justice to be done. We pray for a lasting peace. We pray for the innocent portions and citizens of Gaza Strip in terms of the Palestinians who don't want to be under the governing authority of Hamas, but find themselves fleeing their homes right now. The presence and the peace of Christ is desperately needed in a praying and generous church. And stay tuned as we continue to do that together. Now, I will say that sometimes as a pastor, you set the course of all the different messages in kind of a, a framework for the year. And sometimes something happens in the world and you're like, this text is not appropriate for the moment and the situation that we're in. And so we have to change gears. We have to, to draw from another aspect of God's word to respond to our current and pressing moment. This is one of those moments where the providence of God absolutely amazes me that as we laid out this entire year, that this weekend we would find ourselves in Romans chapter 11. Because there is no greater call and challenge for the church for us to understand our relationship with God's people Israel than this chapter. I'll warn you in advance, this is one of the hardest, most difficult, most complicated chapters of the Bible. And we're going to tackle it today, and I know that you'll stand in there with me, and you'll put on your thinking caps, and we'll go through this uh, together. When we think about Romans chapter 11, as we walk chapter by a chapter through this, we, we see the build of what Paul is doing. That in, in chapter 8, he's talking about all of the promises and the benefits of being in Christ. 
and he talks about how there's no condemnation in Christ, that even our suffering is blanketed by the glory of God. He talks about how we have a hope even though we can't see in the future. He talks about how we're more than conquerors. We're not victims. We're victorious in Christ Jesus. And he talks about how nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. For those in Christ, these are the great and lasting and eternal blessings of God. And then Paul seems to take a pivot and says, what if you're a part of God's covenant people of Israel, but you don't believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah? What then? And so in Romans chapter 9, Paul drills down deep personal anguish into the providence of God. And in doing so, he says, It's not as though the word of God has failed. I will have mercy, he's quoting on behalf of God, on those whom I have mercy. In other words, there's nothing in us that gets us on the pathway of righteousness. It is only God's gracious act towards us. And then in chapter 10, as if to complicate matters further, the Apostle Paul starts talking about the dignity and the beauty of faith, of our human freedom, the necessity of evangelism. And so on the one hand, Paul in Romans chapter 9 is talking about the firm promises of God. In Romans chapter 10, he's talking about our need to respond in faith and how these two things that seem to be a paradox are in lock with one another. And as he's building in this argument, he gets to Romans chapter 11 and in the first verse asks the question that on a conflicted church, looking back on their history in Judaism, is asking, they ask the question basically this way, Has God rejected his people? Has God changed teams? Has God changed the the kind of terms of agreement? That, hey, it was like this for a while, but now it's going to be like that. And we're not burying the lead here. Paul is emphatically saying, no way. And this is how he puts it at the end of the chapter. This is his conclusion. This is where he builds toward. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. But i got to ask you a couple of questions. When Paul says Israel, what does he mean by Israel? Does he mean ethnic Israel? If you're born into Judaism? Does he mean the nation of Israel? If you live within the borders, does he mean practicing Judaism, that that's Israel? Does he mean that it's the church, that it's completed Israel in the Messiah? So when Paul is saying all Israel will be saved, what does he mean by Israel? And while we're at it, and it's my job to make your life more complicated, what does he mean by saved? Does he mean saved from the past sins or just washed out? Does he mean saved for the continuation of the divine vocation to reflect the image of God and to be the light in the dark world? Does he mean saved in terms of the salvation of eternal destiny in heaven? You need to know I took an entire class in seminary on Romans 9 through 11, and I promise you I have read over 30 commentaries on Romans 9 through 11 throughout the course of my career. You want to know what Paul means by this? i got to tell you, I don't have a clue. <laughs> and I hope that that's okay, and I don't mean that as a cop-out. But I never want to stand before you to be claiming to be wiser than I really am. And that somewhere in the great mystery of God's providence and grace and our agency is God's continued dedication to his people Israel. So what can we say with conviction? Let's enter into the argument of this really difficult chapter to understand. And the way I want to do this is to structure this around four different images that Paul lifts up. Because his conviction is is that Israel has not been rejected. And he goes through that in kind of four movements of the symphony. A remnant, a stumble, two brothers, and two branches. First, let's talk about a remnant. This is how Paul talks about it. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left and they seek my life. 
But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed a, kneel to, kneel to Baal, uh, bowed a knee to Baal. And so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. Paul drawing off of the Old Testament goes back to the time where Elijah feels like he's the only one faithful left. And God tells Elijah in the original Hebrew to stop being such a whiner. That he's not the only one left. That there are more. And so bringing this to his present situation, Paul is saying, how can you say that God has rejected his people Israel when for sure there is a faithful remnant within Israel that believe that Jesus is the Messiah? There's no way that God has discarded the old promises. And then in the second movement here of what Paul says, the second image, he talks about a stumble. This is how Paul puts it right here. So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Paul is making a distinction here between a stumble and a fall. So hypothetically speaking, let's say you're watching your favorite football team. And hypothetically speaking, let's say that your favorite football player on your favorite football team falls to the ground. And let's say hypothetically he wears number 19 and his last name is Brock Bowers. (laughs) He falls to the ground and he pounds the ground because he's been injured. The question is, how bad is that injury? Is he going to go out for a play? Is he going to be out for the half? Is he going to be out for the rest of the game? Is he going to be done for the season? Is his career over? Will he ever walk the same way again? There's a difference between one type of injury and another. In Paul's language, a stumble and a fall. The stumble is temporary and has a quick recovery. The fall is something that you might never recover from. So what Paul is saying is just as there is a faithful remnant, a portion of Israel that has not bowed a knee and is worshiping the one true Messiah, in the same way, this is a temporary setback. It's a stumble. It's not a fall. The way he will complete this argument later is this. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be aware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. This is a partial, temporary set back until the full measure of what God's purpose and plan will unfold in creation. So the first image is that of the remnant and that there is a faithful group of people. God could not have abandoned them because there's faithfulness still within it. He also talks about how this is temporary and that this isn't the end of the story. And then thirdly, he brings up the imagery of two brothers. This is how Paul brings it up here. Salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. If you have two kids, and it's Christmas time, and you give one of them one present, and you give one of them no presents, you're going to have mayhem on your hands. When one gets one and the other gets none, you provoke jealousy. This has been going on for a long time. If you go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel, one sacrifice was accepted, the other was not. Jealousy. Continue into the book of Genesis, you have Jacob and Esau. One gets the birthright and the blessing, the other does not. Jealousy. Fast forward to the New Testament and the story of the prodigal son. You have a brother that gets thrown a party and the other one does not. Jealousy. Now hear me in this, the the experience of the emotion of jealousy is not bad. In the same way that the experience of the emotion of anger is not bad. Paul distinguishes and says, be angry but do not sin. 
In other words, there's a difference between the emotion of anger and angry behavior. In the same way, there's a difference between the pinprick of what jealousy is and what you do with that jealousy in your action. It doesn't end very well for the Cain and Abel jealousy side of things. And it does end well for Jacob and Esau because they reconcile. And we don't know how it ends for the story of the prodigal son. It's left open-ended. Here's the point. Paul is saying that the Jews and the Gentiles are like brothers in the faith. And at first, the Jews were given the promises of God, and that made the Gentiles jealous, and they wanted in on those promises. It provoked them to right action. And now over time, as the promises of God have now been given and completed in the Messiah to the Gentiles, Paul is now saying that the Jews have become jealous of the Gentiles in the Messiah. And so what he is saying back and forth is this, is, hey, we're all a part of this family together, and that this inner jealousy is necessary for us to have a fresh desire and awareness to pull us into the fullness of God's promises. I told you this was a complicated chapter. Bear with me. There's one more. This one's even harder, okay? So, a remnant, a stumble, two brothers, and then two branches. This is how Paul talks about it. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember it's not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. Since we don't spend a lot of time doing agriculture, and especially with olive trees, let me explain basically what happens. When you have an olive tree that is starting to languish, the way that you revive that olive tree is you take a wild shoot from a new olive tree and you tie it, you graft it into the old olive tree. And what ends up happening is amazing. The new shoot gets the benefit of having deep old roots. And the old shoot, or the old kind of tree, gets the revival of the energy and the vitality of the new branch. Paul is saying, guys, we're in this together, and that we are tied together, both Jew and Gentile, to be able to hold together a larger family of faith, and that the insider needs the outsider just as much the outsider needs the insider, and that the young needs the old as much as the old needs the young. In other words, we are grafted together. We are the branches of faith. And that we, in this room, who are Gentiles, we need the roots of our faith to go deep into the soil just as much as the renewal of faith needs to happen. So it is through all of these four different images that Paul is saying, of course, God has not rejected his people. And this is the conclusion. If you just like, Rich, you totally lost me like 10 minutes ago. Hang on to this verse. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Will you say this with me? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God is not going to go back on his promises. That he is not only the promise maker, that he is the promise keeper. And that Jesus is the one who will complete the covenant and the promises that began with Abraham, continued through the patriarchs, down through the exodus, and were renewed by the prophets and through the kings. And all of this finds its culmination in Jesus. And you can trust that you, that you in these promises, that in this kind of different images, that you may feel rejected as you come to worship today, you need to know you are not alone. There is a faithful community that will stand with you, that you may feel like your situation and your future is hopeless. I'm here to tell you that it is temporary in the light of eternity, and that there is a greater purpose and design and plan to what God is doing in creation, and that we, yes, even in the midst of conflict, that God's hand is at work. 
and that he is doing so in order to unite us together as a family and that we desperately need one another and we need what we refer to in this church as the unexpected togetherness of God pulling together all of these different strands and branches in order to make us the flourishing tree that God wants us to be able to live out and to be in our day and time. So yes, Romans chapter 11 is mysterious, it's difficult, it's hard, and this theology is so necessary for the church today. This week has, I'm not prone to a lot of nostalgia, but this week has been filled with some nostalgia for me. Because earlier this week, on October the 11th, it was the milestone of 25 years of pastoral ministry for me, that I was ordained on October 11th, 1998. And I was just kind of surprised by how much that hit me, that someone so young could be so advanced in ministry. (laughs) And I got to tell you about my ordination. I was ordained at the First Presbyterian Church of Houston, which is where my grandparents attended for over 50 years. My parents met in the single ministry of First Pres Houston. Um, They were married in that church by my grandfather. And in that church, I was baptized on those steps, and then I was ordained on the very same steps. And so, amazing providential chapter of weaving all of that together. Vic Pence was the the one who preached my ordination sermon. If you don't know who Vic Pence is, he's my predecessor from eight years ago and beyond. And so um, when I got ordained on Sunday morning, this was back in the dark ages where things were broadcast on television and we didn't have DVRs. We had these things called, does anybody remember the VCR (laughs) that had tape in it? And so I, I was setting at home the VCR because the service was broadcast a week later, and I was going to be preaching that Sunday, but early in the morning I got up and I set all the little dials to be able to set the VCR to tape the service because I wanted to be able to keep a copy of it. So the service was being broadcast a week later, and then I watch it after I get home that day, after I preach that day. And as I'm watching the broadcast, across the bottom, there's an image of me that pops up on the screen, and it's like, new pastor, First Presbyterian Church of Houston, Richard Conwisher. And then there was a storm that was blowing into the Houston metropolitan area. So across the top of the screen was warning, warning, (laughs) warning, new associate pastor at First Presbyterian Church of Houston. It could have been that they were warning them about the storm, or it could have been that they were warning them about me and my future ministry. It's probably the former, but I think it's the latter. This morning, when I was preparing for worship, usually I'm praying and cramming, and Pastor Jay walked into the little place where we sit before the service, and uh, he's looking at my paper and he's like what are you doing because it looks like you're doing math you're not getting ready for the service and I said "Um, I'm just curious back of the napkin kind of sketch how many sermons I think I've preached in 25 years of pastoral ministry can I share with you the results so this is the Houston era the New Jersey area the uh, the San Antonio era the California era the Atlanta area 2,790 sermons is the estimate of how many times I've preached on a Sunday morning in my home congregation. And you might think that's a lot, but bear with me for a second. 2,790 sermons at an average of 27 minutes per sermon, which at the 1115 service is a very short estimate because I go longer at this service, equals 75,330 minutes of me preaching. That makes me tired. (laughs) Probably makes you even more tired thinking about it. Here's the point. When I get to heaven, Jesus is not going to ask me how many minutes I preached. And he's not going to ask you how many sermons you had to endure. He is going to ask about my heart for worship. 
And he is going to put the EKG on your heart for your heart of worship. The most important, most significant thing about you and me is what happens when God comes to mind. Here's the amazing part about all of this. I promise you I didn't script this. When I realized this week that it was my milestone of an anniversary, I looked up what I preached on in my first sermon after I was ordained in Houston. My text was Romans 11. In these verses, 33 and following. Oh, the rich, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. And to him be glory forever. Paul gives the most complicated, difficult, politicized, polarizing discourse in any of his correspondence. And there comes a point where he runs out of his words, out of his argument, out of his explanations, out of his images, and he runs into the arms of worship. My sermon title from back in 1998 is the sermon title that's now in your bulletin, When Words Become Worship. Have your words become worship? Paul was writing a letter to build up not just individual believers, but churches in Rome. And it is that same gospel and that same spirit that inspires churches today. We are experiencing the greatest exodus from regular Christian worship right now in American history. People are leaving their churches at a greater rate than they ever have in our country's history. You know the stated reason, and I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here or you're watching this online right now. The stated number one reason is to people why they don't worship anymore in their churches. It doesn't fit my lifestyle anymore. I'm sorry. God calling you together into his family doesn't fit your lifestyle anymore. You need to take a page out of Romans 11. Author Justin Huffman puts it like this. We may be briefly enter entertained by the special effects in the latest blockbuster movie. We may be periodically impressed with the athletic skills of our favorite sports team. We may be temporarily delighted by watching a, by, by a vacation with our family. On an ongoing basis, however, in what we perceive to be the desert wasteland of daily life and regular responsibilities, we are often starving because we lack a basic sense of wonder. Our souls hunger for more. The promise that I made to you when we started this series in Romans is that we would go on a spiritual journey together. And in that spiritual journey, I promised you this, that we would spend several weeks in the mire of what a mess we have made of our lives and the world around us marred by sin, and that we would spend chapters 4 through 7 talking about what a gift that grace is bigger than whatever you are struggling with, and that in this section of chapters 8 through 11, that we would build to the explanation and the exclamation of what a God. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. What a God. For the calling and the promises of God are irrevocable. What a God. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. What a God. 
There is no condemnation in Christ. What a God. Anyone who professes faith will be saved. What a God. Over and over again. It is not as though the word of God has failed. What a God. If you've gotten to this point of the journey and you've been following along in Romans and you haven't gotten to that heart-leaping, soul-churning moment where you cry out, what a God, what a God, that's the invitation to you right now. You don't get any brownie points for sitting through a lot of minutes of sermons. Because the whole point of you being here is to be in the collective effervescence of the Holy Spirit gathered and incubated community that your soul might soar with worship and in wonder. What a God. What a God. And he will never change the terms of agreement. And he will never go back on his promises. What a God. And so let us pray. Eternal and loving Father, we're so grateful. Grateful in a world that seems to be fragmenting and falling apart, that your promises are rock solid and secure. We thank you, O oh God, that you are in charge and that you have given us the free ability to respond in faith, that you will never reject us, you will never change the terms. And that we can be a part of your amazing family of faith. And so I pray that you will inspire us this morning, O oh God. To be stunned by your goodness. To know that we need one another and that you have a plan and that we are not alone. And that we should never confuse your kindness with our pride. Your grace with our entitlement. And your belovedness with favoritism. We should never presume. But we should always know. That the gifts and the calling of you. Are irrevocable. As we now prepare our hearts to stand and to sing in worship of the goodness of God. Mm -hmm.